Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the previous session, we were discussing the Battle of Uhud, the kind of tests that the Muslims had to face, and what was the wisdom behind those tests. We learned that there is khair in success, and there is also khair in defeat. And we also learned that it's important at times to face failure, because that is when we start asking the right kind of questions, and our true level of Iman becomes exposed. Now, continuing on with this discussion in verses 149 onwards, Allah says, O you who have believed, if you obey those who disbelieve, they will turn you back on your heels and you will then become losers. But Allah is your protector and he is the best of helpers. We will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve for what they have associated with Allah, of which he had not sent down any authority. And their refuge will be the fire and wretched is the residence of the wrongdoers. Now, although the revelation of such verses helped to calm the Muslims and it did boost their faith, they still had to deal with the Jews, the hypocrites, the polytheists, all of the kafirs who were mocking them and ridiculing them after their defeat at Ohad. And they were working hard to raise doubts regarding the authenticity of the Prophet. So even though, as we discussed in the previous episode, Allah did respond. And He did inform the Jews that they know there were many Prophets sent to them who also faced defeat. This is not the first Prophet who has faced defeat during a battle. Despite that, the Jews kept trying to raise doubts regarding Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the minds of the more naive Muslims. So in this regard, Allah warns the Muslims in verses 149 and 150 that they should refrain from obeying or listening to the disbelievers who only want to spread facade and mischief. And they are working hard to drive the believers away from Islam by giving Muslims guarantees of protection and help. So a clear reminder is being given to the believers that their sole protector and helper is Allah, and they need to remain focused on their mission and goal. Just as everyone has a plan, Allah too has a plan, and He has the ability to implement His plan. So with the defeat at Ohad, disbelievers in the Arab region gained courage to attack the Muslims, believing that they could now wipe out Islam. In other words, after the Battle of Badr, a lot of the Arab polytheist tribes started to fear the Muslims. But after the Battle of Ohad, they started to believe that they could now defeat the Muslims. So not only were attacks planned on Medina, but several Arab tribes asked Muhammad, peace be upon him, to send Muslims to their tribe to teach them about Islam. And when groups of Muslims were sent to those tribes, those polytheist tribes would launch surprise attacks on the Muslims and they would kill them, or they would sell them into slavery. So what you see is that the minute the Battle of Ohad happened, and the Muslims faced defeat, there were a lot of challenges that the Muslims had to face. It wasn't just the defeat they had to deal with, it wasn't just the Munafiks and the Jews in Medina they had to deal with, but the entire Arab region started to attack Islam. A lot of the polytheist, mushrikeen tribes started to believe that they can eradicate Islam. So Muslims suddenly started to face a lot of challenges from every area. And of course, this diminished the morale of the Muslims. So in this regard, Allah promises them in verse 150 that soon he will cast terror in the hearts of the disbelievers so that they will once again fear the Muslims. And this occurred approximately one year after the Battle of Ohud, when Abu Sufyan promised another military encounter at Badr during 4 AH. So what this means is at that time, Abu Sufyan was a polytheist. He had not embraced Islam and he was the chief of the Quraysh. So as soon as the Battle of Ahad was over, and it was clear that the Quraysh have won, Abu Sufyan challenged the Muslims at that moment to another military encounter at Badr one year later. And so at that point, the Muslims assembled another army of 1,500 men, while Abu Sufyan prepared an army of 2,000 men. However, as the disbelievers were marching from Mecca to Badr, and the Muslims were marching from Medina to Badr, suddenly Abu Sufyan became so terrified of the battle that he decided to just retreat to Mecca. So for no reason, he just turned around and went back. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, took the Muslim army. He waited at Badr for a few days. And when it became clear that the Quraysh are just not coming, the Muslim army turned back and went to Medina. And at this point, it was a huge victory for the Muslims because in the entire Arab region, the news spread that the most powerful tribe, Quraysh, got scared of the Muslims. And they simply turned around and retreated back to Mecca. 
And this is what Allah meant when he promised that eventually I will put so much fear, terror in the hearts of the disbelievers that they will fear the Muslims. Then in verses 152 onwards, Allah says, And Allah had certainly fulfilled his promise to you when you were killing the enemy by his permission, until the time when you lost courage and fell to disputing about the order given by the Prophet and disobeyed after he had shown you that which you love. Among you are some who desire this world and among you are some who desire the Akhirah. Then he turned you back from the defeated that he might test you. And he has already forgiven you, and Allah is the possessor of bounty for the believers. And remember when you fled and climbed the mountain without looking aside at anyone while the messenger was calling you from behind. So Allah repaid you with distress upon distress, so that you would not grieve for that which had escaped you or that which had befallen you. And Allah is fully acquainted with what you do. So what you can see here is that despite the consoling verses and the emphasis of tests and hardships, and why it's important to fail at times because Muslims have to gain mastery in faith, the question still remained that given the weak position of the Muslim Ummah during its early period and all the enemies that were surrounding it, why would Allah grant victory to the disbelievers when he could have tested the Muslims in some other way? In other words, if the point was to expose the Iman of the believers, if the point was to put them through hardship, Allah could have chosen any other way of doing it. Why did he have to choose this way? And this precise question perturbed those with weak iman so much to which Allah responds in verses 152 and 153 by recounting the entire incident at Uhud to remind the Muslims that they were winning with the help of Allah. Their defeat was because some of them were distracted by the spoils of war while others let the fear of death overcome them and they ran up the Mount Uhud instead of remaining steadfast and fighting. It was a message that believers should not focus on their defeat but on Allah's mercy that despite all the mistakes they made on the battle of Uhud, He still forgave them. And that is what Allah mentions here in this verse as evidence that the archers who made a mistake, all the Muslims who abandoned the battlefield and they ran up Mount Uhud, which is considered to be a huge sin, Allah is saying that despite all the mistakes you made, I've still forgiven you. So why not focus on my mercy and the fact that I'm still being a rahman I'm not punishing you, instead of questioning why did you fail in the first place? Why are you forgetting that you failed because of your own shortcomings? You were winning in the beginning because Allah was with you and Allah was with you because you were following Allah's commands. It is when you went against the Prophet's order and you prioritized the spoils of war as well as your own life over and above the Prophet and Islam, that's when you started to fail. So why not point the finger at yourself instead of expecting that Allah should grant you victory even though you deliberately went against His commands and you transgressed? In fact, if you remember in the previous episode, I was reiterating how in almost every verse towards the end, Allah kept telling the Muslims, be grateful, be grateful. And the reason was because even though you have transgressed, Allah is telling the Muslims, I'm still forgiving you. And not just forgiving you, I'm sending you verses of consolation, even though you are the ones who made the mistake. You were winning and then you subsequently lost because of your own transgressions. Yet I am not just forgiving you, I'm sending you words of consolation. I'm trying to make you feel better. So if anything, be grateful. Besides that, you'll also see a beautiful lesson that Allah is explaining in verse 153 that at times there is hikmat in being given several tests in one short span of time. So at times when Allah sends one test after the next after the next, there is hikmat in that as well. Just like in the battle of Uhud, not only were the Muslims suddenly facing defeat and losing the spoils of war, but then they were tested even more when they saw so many sahabas losing their lives. And then they were tested more when the rumor spread that the Prophet has perhaps lost his life as well, even he's a shaheed. And then it got worse when suddenly so many people ran up the Mount Ohad and abandoned the Prophet. So it was one distress after the next, after the next. And Allah tells us at times when I send you so many problems over a short span of time, I do that so that you will stop grieving over what has escaped you. And also you will stop being upset about what has befallen you. And what that actually means is when a Muslim is tested so severely, eventually a time comes when he stops grieving, he stops fearing the future, because he realizes that I've been tested so many times, but I'm still alive, I'm still surviving. 
And every time I think that, okay, my life is now going to be over, somehow through a miracle, Allah is able to remove the test and then I start to get better. And then yes, another test comes, but through some miracle, again, I'm able to survive. And then a third test comes over and yet again, through a miracle, I'm able to survive. So then the Muslim reaches a stage where he doesn't fear the future anymore because he's been tested so much in such a short span of time that he finally realizes he's not in control. He finally understands that he was never in control. Allah is in control. And the one in control is looking after him. Yes, he's putting him in a lot of tests, but every time he's also getting him out of those tests. So then the Muslim suddenly stops fearing the future and he stops grieving over the past. He stops asking questions like, how is Allah going to possibly remove this test? When is Allah going to remove it? How am I going to survive? Because he realizes that every time Allah through some miracle ends up removing the test. So there's no point I even ponder or even think about this. Allah's got a plan. And according to that plan, he's going to remove this test as well. How? I don't know. When? I don't know. But I know it's going to happen. So then in verse 154, Allah says, Then after distress, he sent down upon you security in the form of drowsiness, overcoming a faction of you, while another faction worried about themselves, thinking of Allah other than the truth. The thought of ignorance, saying, Is there anything for us in this matter? Say, Indeed, the matter belongs to Allah. They conceal within themselves what they will not reveal to you. They say, If there was anything we could have done in the matter, some of us would not have been killed here. Say, Even if you had been inside your houses, those decreed to be killed would have come out to their deathbeds. It was so that Allah might test what is in your chest and purify what is in your hearts and Allah's knowing of that which is within the chest. So the defeat of the Battle of Uhud and the loss of lives of so many Sahabas created confusion and disappointment amongst the believers. But those with very strong Iman, Allah sent calmness as a sign of His mercy to strengthen them. In other words, this was such a shock to all of the Muslims that even those with strong Iman even they were shaken. They were not just shaken by the defeat that they faced, but the fact that they had lost so many Sahabas, that so many Sahabas embraced Shahadat on that day, including Hazrat Hamza. So Allah is seeing that even those with strong Iman have been shaken to the core, and they themselves are grieving and they themselves are disappointed and confused. Allah sends sukoon and calmness into their hearts. And the beauty of this is because if the strong Sahabas who everyone looks up to, if they start to panic, then everyone is going to panic. So in order to calm everyone down, it was important to put peace into the hearts of not just Muhammad, peace be upon him, but also all of the other Sahabas who had very strong Iman. Because of course, that is going to have a contagious effect and is going to spread positivity to everyone else as well. Now, interestingly, despite all of this, there were some Muslims who had so much doubt that was arising in their hearts that they started to question the entire plan of fighting at Ohad in the first place. And that's what Allah is quoting them when they started to say, did we have any say in this matter? In other words, nobody even asked us. If somebody asked us, then we would have told them that this is a bad idea and none of this would have happened. We wouldn't have lost the lives of so many Sahabas. And I mentioned this in Surah Baqarah series as well, that at times when a Muslim starts to experience munafqat, he tends to oscillate between being a muttaqeen and being a munafiq. In other words, these Muslims were muttaqeen enough to go and fight in the battlefield in the first place. But at the same time, they would oscillate and at times behave like a munafiq by actually doubting the Prophet and doubting Allah's plan and thinking that we should never have fought here in the first place. It was a bad idea. If we had to fight, then we should have fought in Medina just like Abdullah ibn Ubay suggested. Had the Muslims followed him, they would not have lost so many lives or faced such defeat. So Allah responds now to these Muslims of weak Iman by arguing that the time and place of death of every person has already been predestined. The companions who embraced Shahadat at Ohad were destined to lose their lives on that day and on that place. Those who wish to remain hiding in their homes for the fear of death should know that they will inevitably be taken to their place of death at the predetermined time. Because Allah has not just destined the time of your death, but also the place of your death. It has already been decreed. You cannot escape it. So it is futile to fear death. Instead, it is best to fear standing in front of Allah, 
knowing that every action and deed will be recorded and questioned. The loss at Uhud was not because of poor planning or because Allah was not able to save the Muslims. It was a defeat that resulted from ignorance towards the Prophet's commands and a love, a desire for the spoils of war over the Akhirah. It was because there was so much greed still in the hearts of some of the Muslims that they had still prioritized their life and their wealth over and above the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So failing this test was inevitable because not all the Muslims had the correct intention, nor had they internalized the vision of their leader, Muhammad, peace be upon him. And that's what Allah was trying to explain to the Muslims, that if you didn't fail at the Battle of Ahad, you would have failed in some other subsequent battle. Failure was inevitable because a lot of you still have the love of dunya in your hearts. And an ummah cannot win battles and it cannot do ikamat e deen if it is obsessing over dunya. That was the entire reason that the previous ummah failed. So through this failure at Ahad, Allah had to expose their level of iman so each Muslim could improve himself and the ummah could be strengthened. And just the mere fact that this is constantly being repeated in these verses as well as the verses we saw in the previous episode just goes to show that this was not just a small incident that took place. The defeat at Ahad was so incredibly demotivating and it wasn't just what they had to experience during the Battle of Ahad but subsequently after it that Allah had to constantly send verses to console and reassure the Muslims. It just goes to show how much Allah loves his own slaves, how much at times Allah becomes a friend, that instead of scolding them, Allah constantly keeps sending them verses of consolation. Then in verse 155, it says, Indeed, those of you who turned back on the day the two armies met, it was shaitan who caused them to slip because of some blame they had earned. But Allah has already forgiven them. Allah's forgiving and forbearing. So as I mentioned before, the fear of death the love of this dunya, these are weaknesses that prevent a believer from doing jihad in the cause of Allah. These have to be abolished. The heart has to be cleansed of these things so that the Muslims can fight together united as one ummah, and only then can Islam survive and spread throughout the world. If the vision of the Prophet is not internalized in the hearts of every Muslim, if there is a fear of making sacrifices for the sake of Allah, then an individual becomes easily susceptible to the whispers of shaitan. That's when a Muslim will constantly have anxiety, depression, and despair because the waswasi of shaitan will automatically cause him to fear struggling in the cause of Allah. But as you can see, Allah keeps repeating that despite everything that has happened, Allah is so kind and generous, He has forgiven all the Muslims. He has forgiven everyone who made a mistake on that day. So then verses 156 onwards, it says, O oh, you who have believed, do not be like those who disbelieved and said about their brothers when they traveled through the land or went out to fight that if they had been with us, they would not have died or they would not have been killed. So Allah makes that misconception a regret within their hearts. And it is Allah who gives life and causes death. Allah is seeing of what you do. And if you are killed in the cause of Allah or die, then forgiveness from Allah and mercy are better than whatever you can accumulate in this world. And whether you die or are killed, unto Allah you will be gathered. So finally, there was a need to alter the mindset of the believers when dealing with the grief of those who had lost the lives of loved ones at the Battle of Ahad. Allah advised the Muslims to not pay heed to the hypocrites and the disbelievers. Those who lost their lives on the battlefield should not be a cause of sigh and regret because they are destined for Jannat now. And they have achieved the ultimate reward of Allah's pleasure and Allah's infinite mercy which is so much better, which is far superior than being granted a few more years in this world, than being granted material assets and wealth and gold, because there can be nothing better than knowing that your Lord is happy with you and your Lord has prepared for you a Jannat in which you will live forever. So Allah reminds the hypocrites and the Muslims of weak Iman, everyone has to face death. Everyone has to go back to Allah. There is no greater success than dying while fighting in the cause of Allah. Then in verses 159 and 160, it says, So by mercy from Allah, O Muhammad, peace be upon him, you were lenient with them. If you had been rude and harsh in heart, they would have disbanded from about you. So pardon them and ask forgiveness for them and consult them in the matter 
And when you have decided, then rely upon Allah. Indeed, Allah loves those who rely upon Him. If Allah should help you, no one can overcome you. But if Allah should forsake you, who is there that can aid you after Him? And upon Allah, let the believers rely. So while training the believers and answering the questions and doubts of those with weak iman, Allah also shifts briefly to address Muhammad, peace be upon him as well, who also needed guidance regarding how to handle the situation and calm everyone down. So he was being reminded to act gently towards the Muslims, regardless of the mistakes that they had committed, because dealing harshly with them or punishing them at this stage would result in disgruntled believers who would just leave Islam. Don't forget, this is the early period of the Ummah's formation. So Allah understood that the Iman of many of the Muslims was still too weak and they were not yet ready to make sacrifices. They were still being trained and groomed and therefore adopting a lenient approach was important at this stage. However, given that Muhammad peace be upon him was a human who might have found it difficult to always control his anger or frustration or disappointment, Allah placed his special mercy on Muhammad peace be upon him. That's why not only was he lenient and gentle towards the believers, but he was also asking Allah for forgiveness on behalf of those who had made a mistake, just as Allah had commanded him to do so. And in addition, unlike an average human, he held no grievances towards any of the Muslims who made a mistake at the Battle of Uhud. And clearly this is humanely very difficult to achieve because every human has enough, every human has emotions and at times there is frustration and anger. And we have also seen in the previous episodes that as soon as the Battle of Uhud was over and Muhammad peace be upon him was severely wounded and at that time in disappointment he said to the other Muslims that how will Allah guide a nation like this that treats its messenger in this way? So we do understand that being a Muslim there was frustration in him and rightly so he should have been disappointed. But the fact that surprisingly after that he was so calm and so patient with everyone. He was helping to boost the morale of all of the Muslims and he forgave from his heart all the archers who made a mistake, all of the Muslims who abandoned him on the battlefield. That is something which Allah is explaining was only possible because Allah put that special mercy and softness in his heart. Allah knew that if the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, despite the fact that he was such a loving person, if he showed frustration or anger at this stage, many of the Muslims might actually leave Islam. This is the Ummah's early period of formation and they need a leader who will deal with them extremely leniently. And besides this, also in verse 159, you see that Allah is telling Muhammad peace be upon him that not only should he forgive all of those who made a mistake on the battle of Uhud, but he should continue to trust them and even consult them in the future. Instead of reminding them constantly that they made a mistake on the Battle of Uhud or making them just feel that the Prophet doesn't want to seek advice from them anymore, the Prophet doesn't trust them anymore, even that feeling should not be given to them. Because if Allah has forgiven them, that means they now have a clean slate. And yes, they made a mistake, but that does not mean that they should not be trusted in the future. And we as Muslims can learn so much from that because at times you know people who have made mistakes. And Allah is saying that when you forgive someone, it means that you do not continuously remind them or humiliate them about the mistake that they made. You don't belittle them because that will destroy their self-confidence. It will destroy their self-esteem and their own self-respect. It will actually destroy their peace and their mental health. So yes, if there's a Muslim who continues to go against you and who continues to transgress your commands, then there is a need to abstain from such people because they are clearly monophics and they are toxic. But if there is a Muslim who just made a mistake once and that Muslim is subsequently doing tawbah, he is acknowledging his mistake, then the community needs to give him a second chance. So although these verses were addressing Muhammad peace be upon him, it was teaching the Muslims the wisdom behind seeking consultation before making important decisions and then trusting Allah once the decision has been made. The Almighty has gifted humans with superior intellect and reasoning abilities that makes them the best of His creations. So a believer should not just engage in acts of worship and expect Allah to decide matters for him. Instead, by seeking advice from close family and friends and trustworthy, reliable believers, he should make the necessary effort to decide himself what he believes is the best course of action while seeking Allah's guidance while ensuring that he does not transgress or displease Allah. 
Effort and taqwa are necessary because if Allah is there to help, then no one can overcome. And if Allah is displeased with his slave, then no one in the universe can help that slave. And finally, once the matter has been decided, the believer should then have complete trust in Allah. Once the believer has taken advice and consulted close family and friends and other reliable Muslims, and once he has decided on a course of action, he should have complete yaqeen in Allah as well as in himself. At that point, he should not doubt Allah, nor should he doubt himself. Therefore, just as the message of Ayatul Kursi, which was revealed before the Battle of Badr to boost the Iman of believers, in the same way these verses convey the same message as Ayatul Kursi, but they were revealed to boost the Iman of believers after the defeat at Uhud. Forgive, trust each other again, reunite as an Ummat, Remain focused, remembering that if Allah is with you, no one can overcome you. Boost your level of taqwa and tawakkal. And then once you have decided on a course of action, have yaqeen in Allah as well as in yourself. So we will end the session here and inshallah continue on in the next episode with the remaining verses. Assalamu alaikum.